I now call to order the Society's 2,494th meeting in what is now the 153rd year since its founding on March 13th, 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members, guests, and friends to tonight's PSW meeting and the lecture by Richard Pyle. We also welcome members and guests of the Washington Academy of Sciences who are co-participants in tonight's event. A warm welcome to them all. Thank you for joining us. The Society is grateful to PSW Full Year Series sponsor, PSW members Mike Helton and Helton Associates LLC for their support. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> and to the sponsor of tonight's lecture, PSW member Frederica DeRema. Frederica. For those of you who have been in hibernation, we had an eclipse recently. It was a total solar eclipse, which was visible from parts of the United States. Many PSW members traveled far and wide to see this eclipse. For anyone who missed totality, we have a few spectacular photographs that were taken by a friend, PSW member Gene Morrow, This is a reconstructed progression from just before to just after totality. These are all taken by um, Gene from his SLR camera. I can tell you he did far better than I did with my iPhone. This is one from just around totality. You can see the, the flares, the red spots. Hmm? Ah, uh, what location? I forgot. Where? Pittsburgh. We went to Cleveland, and it was spectacular, but I didn't get good photographs. And then this is totality. And you can see uh, the sun's rays. So thank you so much, Gene. I'm pleased to announce the following new members admitted to the society. Matthew Fabian, a biologist with the FDA, interested in plant biology, agronomy, and public health, computing, and space exploration, who earned a PSW from a Reddit string. David Hermans, a satellite system engineer with Lockheed Martin, interested in aerospace engineering space sciences, earth sciences, and astrophysics, among others, who earned a PSW from searching the internet for science lecture series. And Abby Myers Bassasoni, a data analytics manager at the Arlington Partnership for Affordable Housing, interested in public health, neurobehavioral and social sciences, and computer science, who learned a PSW also from that Reddit string I mentioned a minute ago. And tonight's speaker, Richard Pyle, who went to PSW from our invitation to him to speak here tonight and whose interests will be clear to you in some small part, or maybe more than a small part, from tonight's lectures. All members are entitled to a signed copy of volume one of the bulletin of the Philosophical Society of Washington, and if they so choose to wear the ribbon of the society. If you are a new member and you do not receive a signed copy of the bulletin, please see me after the meeting. Recording Secretary Scott Matthews will now present the minutes of the 2,493rd meeting and the lecture by Philip DeShong on encapsulation. Scott, the stage is yours.
Good evening. On April 5th, 2024, in the Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., President Larry Milstein called the 2,493rd meeting of the Society to order at 8.05 p.m. Eastern Time. He began by welcoming attendees, thanking sponsors for their support, and announcing new members. Scott Matthews then read the minutes of the previous meeting, which included the lecture by Thomas Carr and James Trebes, entitled Emerging Directed Energy Weapons. The minutes were approved as read. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Philip DeShong of the University of Maryland. His lecture was titled, We Have You Surrounded, Encapsulation and Its Application to Vaccine Formulation and Drug Delivery. The speaker began by presenting a brief history of vaccine development, starting first with a smallpox, smallpox vaccine by Jenner in 1796, the first rabies vaccine by Pasteur in 1815, the Sauk Sabin polio vaccines in 1955, and the mumps, measles, rubella vaccines, which appeared in the 1960s and 1970s. DeShong indicated that prior to 1980, vaccines were produced using dead or attenuated microorganisms. Since 1980, most vaccines are, quote, subunit vaccines, wherein a gene for a specific antigen from the virus or bacterium was transferred to another organism to produce large quantities of the antigen, which could be isolated and purified to form the vaccine. He described the mechanisms by which these vaccines impart immunity by saying that the innate response, innate immune response chews up the foreign microorganisms and presents the fragments to the adaptive immune response, which creates highly specific antibodies to the antigen. DeShong then discussed mRNA vaccines and the various advantages of the mRNA technique. He explained that the mRNA, which is essentially the factory for the antigen, is readily grown using molecular biology techniques, does not require antigens to be grown in cells, does not require isolation or purification, and does not require that the proteins be formulated into a vaccine, which could alter the structure of the proteins. He then discussed the problems with this approach. mRNA rapidly degrades in the body, mRNA must get inside a cell before it can produce proteins. There is no mechanism for the uptake of N mRNA into cells. Deschamps said, quote, it's a great idea, except it doesn't work, unquote. Then he stated that in combination with codon optimization, mRNA could be encapsulated in such a way that it was both protected from degradation and exhibits extremely enhanced cellular uptake. He indicated that both the BioNTech and Moderna vaccines use this encapsulation technique in the COVID-19 vaccines. DeShong indicated that the remainder of the talk would be about colloidal chemistry and the use of liposomes as encapsulants. He explained the chemistry of liposome formation, free lipids rapidly forming a micelle and micelles slowly converting into liposomes or lipid nanoparticles with a spherical lip lipid shell and a void inside. He discussed the optimization of liposomes for the delivery of mRNA, including the type of lipids, the stability of the liposomes, the size of the lipid bubbles, and the microfluidic devices for producing uniform sizes. He stated that there are currently more than 200 clinical trials being conducted using mRNA vaccines encapsulated in liposomes and that encapsulated mRNA represents a paradigm shift in vaccine technology. He predicted that mRNA vaccines will replace all or most subunit vaccines in the near future. Deshong then described a more advanced liposome made from common soaps, which are called surfactant vesicles. He indicated that these liposomes had many desirable properties, including spontaneous formation in physiological saline, narrow size distribution, stability of more than five years, ability to withstand higher temperatures, lower cost, and functionalizable surfaces. The speaker described how surfactant vesicles could be used to create an artificial cell or an artificial virus by decorating the vesicle's outer surface with various biological molecules. He showed a picture of a surfactant vesicle decorated with a spike protein to mimic a COVID-19 virus. 
Deschamps claimed to have produced artificial pathogens for several gram-negative bacteria, viruses, and a biowarfare agent. Deschamps ended his lecture by stating that he, believed, that he believes future work in vaccine development and drug delivery research will include liposomal encapsulation, surfactant encapsulation, and other advanced encapsulation techniques. The lecture was followed by a question and answer session. A guest asked why the pathogen, why the artificial pathogen, which closely resembles the actual pathogen, does not infect the patient with the disease. Deshang responded by saying that the artificial pathogen does not contain the DNA and mRNA of the pathogen and therefore cannot reproduce and cause infection. A member asked whether Deshang had used modeling and AI as a tool for optimizing the liposomes. Deshang responded that modeling is regularly used to predict and optimize the formation of the liposome or vesicle and that he currently had students in his lab attempting to use AI to develop new encapsulants. A member asked which diseases would be treated with mRNA vaccines in the near future. Deshong indicated that viruses would be first, likely followed by bacteria, and eventually cancers. A guest asked about the toxicity of the surfactant vesicles. Deshong indicated that the toxicity is similar to liposomes. Several questions were asked about the COVID-19 virus and the mRNA vaccines for COVID-19. While Deshong tried to answer these questions in a general way, he indicated that he was not an expert on COVID-19 and that he did not feel comfortable giving definitive answers to several of the questions. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker and presented him with a PSW rosette, a signed copy of the announcement of his talk, a signed copy of volume one of the PSW bulletin, he then announced speakers of upcoming lectures, made a number of housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. He adjourned the 2,493rd meeting of the society at 9.53 p.m. Eastern Time. Temperature in Washington, D.C., 7.2 degrees Celsius. Weather, partly cloudy. Audience in the Powell Auditorium, 46. Viewers on the live stream, 17 for a total of 63 live viewers. Views of the video in the first two weeks, 176. Respectfully submitted, Scott Matthews, Recording Secretary. Thank you, Scott. Are there any comments or corrections to the minutes? Uh, hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to accept the minutes as read. I have a second. All members in favor? All members opposed? The minutes are accepted unanimously as read and will be posted to the website in due course with one caveat. If there are comments that necessitate corrections that come in over the web, we will incorporate those into the minutes prior to posting. And we now turn to tonight's lecture by Richard Pyle. Richard is the Director of Natural Resources and Senior Curator of Ichthyology at the Bernice P. Bishop Museum in Honolulu. He is also a commissioner for the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature and the founder of ZooBank and other biodiversity data systems. One of Richard's research focuses is exploring and documenting the biodiversity of mesophotic coral ecosystems, that is, coral reefs in the so-called twilight zone, at depths of 30 to 200 meters and deeper. He has led and supported over 80 research expeditions around the tropical Indo-Pacific, with particular emphasis on the discovery of new species and on documenting power patterns of biogeography and death distributions. Another of his research focuses is the development of computer database systems to manage systematic and biogeographical information. Richard is an author on over 220 scientific, technical, and popular articles and chapters on ichthyology, diving technology, and biodiversity. Among many public presentations, Richard did the first ever real-time scientific expedition blogs in 1997, supported and published by the New York Times. 
He has also been featured in over 50 film projects, including IMAX, National Geographic, BBC, and Discovery Channel productions. Among many other honors and awards, Richard received a MacArthur Genius Grant, a Best and Brightest Award from Esquire magazine, and the Nogi Award for Science from the Academy of Underwater Arts and Sciences. He earned a BS and PhD in zoology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. As usual, all questions will be fielded in a Q&A session after the lecture. Without further ado, Richard, the stage is yours. Great. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. It's an honor to be with all of you tonight, and I, I'm looking forward to sharing some of my thoughts with you. I have to make one correction. I, I have to have not received a MacArthur Genius Award. It was a General Electric Genius Award. Close. Um, not quite as much money, but some money came along with it. Um, but anyway, I wanted to set the record straight. So um, thank you again for coming this evening online and in person. And I will hopefully tell you a few things that you didn't know, but actually a lot of the things I'm going to tell you, you already do know. But what my hope is, is that I will tell them to you in a way that you might not have thought of them before. I will arrange these things in a pattern that maybe you hadn't seen through before and, and maybe come out of this with a different perspective of what I personally believe to be perhaps the greatest story on Earth. And I'll get into that in a little bit uh, as I get into this. But um, I want to begin with a metaphor. And so I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine you're standing in the world's greatest library, the most impressive, magnificent library on Earth. Countless volumes, room after room after room, filled with exquisite texts. It's got the wisdom accumulated over all of Earth's history. And it's burning. All of this is in jeopardy. All of this incredible information surrounding you is disappearing. What are you going to do? Well, you do the obvious thing. You gather a bunch of people, call them together, give them tools of the trade, firefighters, and you extinguish the flames, right? That's the obvious thing you do when you're confronted with something so precious and valuable that's burning right in front of you, right? But after a while of doing this, you realize progress is slow because the fire, fire continues to rage, and you realize that the crisis is far more extensive than you imagined it was. And behind every door, down every corridor, everywhere you look, the fire continues to spread and grow. What are you going to do? You have no idea how big the library is, right? And nor do you know how much of it's burning. You need to change tactics because you realize you're losing this fight against the fire. So what you do is you take some of the firefighters, not all of them, most of them keep doing their job trying to fight the blaze, but you take some of them. And instead of having them fight the fire, you send them deep into the blaze. You send them down the corridors, in the far corners of the library. And they, they are the scouts. They have two jobs. Their first job is to explore the library, to find out where the fires are burning, where the rare book collection is, where are the books that haven't even been entered into the card catalog system yet. They build a map of the library, so they provide that map to the firefighters so the firefighters can be more efficient and effective in trying to fight the blaze in the most important ways where they're needed. They have a second job, and in some ways this job is even more important. While they're deep in there, in the inferno, they grab as many copies of the books as they can, and they run outside of the library and bring those copies and put them in a vault out across the street. They need to document exactly where each book came from and under what, you know, what circumstances and how it fits into the broader context. And the reason they're doing this is if the worst should happen, if the vast information of the library is lost, at least some of that information will be protected outside of the blaze. There will be some hope of rebuilding the, the, the library because even though many of the books have been lost, as much of the information has been captured for future generations. All right. We're going to come back to that metaphor in a bit, but I want you to be imagining that circumstance. And now I want you to continue to imagine. Imagine a group of extraterrestrial beings visited our little solar system out here, right? They just saw the, saw the sun, thought, hey, let's go look at some of these planets. And they started looking at the planets orbiting the sun. 
Now, which one would they find most amazing of all? Well, it's not the tiny one that's really hot close to the sun. That's probably not going to stand out to them. The cold blue one out in the distance probably won't get their attention. You know, the one with the big orange spot, interesting, maybe. And then the one with the dramatic rings, also interesting. But you know as well as I do that an alien society that came to our solar system would find one of these planets particularly interesting. It's the ocean world, third from the sun. Now, obviously, you might think, well, of course that's the one that's interesting. It's full of water. Water is so precious. Of course, water is precious. But you know what? Water is ubiquitous in the universe. It's really not that unusual. And the only thing it takes to make it liquid is the right amount of heat. It's not the water that makes Earth stand out in our solar system. What makes Earth stand out among our solar system, and in fact, maybe in this whole part of the galaxy, we don't know how unique this is. But what, make Earth, what makes Earth stand out isn't just the presence of life, but the incredible spectrum of biodiversity that lives there. So let's think about that word, biodiversity, for a moment. You've all heard it. You've all read about it. You know this word. You think you understand what it means. You probably do understand what it means. But I could give you a textbook definition, like the biodiversity is the totality of all living things on Earth, including all of the ways they interact with each other and affect their surrounding environment, something to that effect. You might even already understand that human civilization depends on biodiversity for survival. This has been well documented in many places. It's almost common knowledge, at least among well-educated people. But I want to give you another perspective on biodiversity and told a different way that I hope will kind of give you a different perspective of what biodiversity really is. And I'm going to tell a story. It's a long story. In fact, it's a four billion year old story. But I'm going to tell it backwards. So I'm going to start with the ending of the story. And this photograph shows you the ending of the story. And the ending of the story is two large vertebrates met each other, 400 feet deep off South Africa. This was about 15 years ago. And um, that's where the story ends. As you might guess, the one on the left is me. And the one on the right is a coelacanth. Now, I'm sure a lot of you know what a coelacanth is. If you don't know what a coelacanth is, it's still heralded as one of the greatest biological discoveries of the 20th century. It's a particular kind of fish that was thought to have gone extinct 70 million years ago at the same time the dinosaurs did, until one was caught off South Africa in the 1930s. And it was a huge deal. It was equivalent of finding a dinosaur wandering around the jungles of Kondo. It was a big, big deal. So it's a very special fish. It's a very ancient fish. And so I'm going to tell you the story of how this coelacanth and I that met when we last encountered each other. And I'm going to do that by walking backwards through time. So at the time, I was in my 40s. I was about 40 years old. These are my parents. And it turns out coelacanths live to be about 80 years old, not too different from human beings. So let's just presume I met a middle-aged coelacanth whose parents also were around 40 years ago. All right, this is pretty straightforward understanding. We all understand that children come from parents. That's an easy thing to get your head around. So let's go back in time a little bit further. So I'm going to go back a long time. So my mom was into genealogy, so she actually knows our family history. So my grandfather, my great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, so on and so forth, she's traced it back all the way back to one particular guy, and I'm a direct descendant of this guy. You may or may not recognize him. His name was Miles Standish. He was on the Mayflower, and he was one of the first leaders of the Plymouth Colony. I'm a direct descendant of him. I'm not sure that's a good thing when you start learning about his bio bi biography, but the point is that I can trace my ancestry back generation after generation after generation over dozens of reproductive events and, and, and see that this is the lineage in my own family. Now, coelacanths don't keep records like that. Um, I'm pretty sure none of them were on the Mayflower, but the biologist in me knows that that coelacanth also had grandparents and great parents and so on and so forth back 400 years um, uh, to some ancestor that very likely lived off South Africa uh, 400 years ago. Let's go another power of 10. So we went from 40 to 400. Let's go to 4,000. What's happening in my family lineage? Well, to the best of my understanding, I can trace my ancestry back to people who lived in Mesopotamia about 4,000 years ago. This is what Wikipedia says someone from Mesopotamia looks like. I am descended from people who lived there. Coelacanth, 
not Mesopotamia, but it could trace its ancestry back generation after generation after generation to some population of coelacanths somewhere in the western Indian Ocean. Let's go another power 10. You're starting to see the pattern here. We're going through powers of 10 here. So now we're going to go back 40,000 years ago, right? What's going on in my family history? My family history going back in time, people were just beginning to spread through Europe, um, which is where my ancestry comes from, uh, working with stone tools, uh, sort of the before civilization, but kind of becoming more advanced in the primate world. And coelacanth was kind of just a coelacanth. In fact, there's not a whole lot that's going to change on the coelacanth side of the story for a few more slides, so be forewarned. But I want you to remember that those lines aren't lines. What they represent is an unbroken chain of reproductive events, generation after generation after generation, in this case, 200 generations, well, actually 2,000 generations, over and over again. There is an unbroken line of succession of living beings connected over all of this vast amount of time. So let's go back farther. Let's go back another power of 10. This time we're looking 400,000 years ago. This is around the time where humans were figuring out how to deal with fire. We're still mostly on the African continent back then. But now we're talking about time scales that are much bigger than just genealogy. Now we're actually getting into the realm of evolution because our ancestors, everyone in this room, were actually so different from us, Homo sapiens, that anthropologists give them a different scientific name. That was Homo heidelbergensis 400,000 years ago. And it wasn't just our ancestor, it was also the ancestor of another human you may have heard of, the Neanderthals, okay? So now we're getting into scales of time where life is starting to change at a level that taxonomists would recognize as species. Coelacanth, still a coelacanth. One more power 10, now we're four million years back, okay? And you may have heard of our ancestor from four million years ago. There's one particular fossil, goes by the name of Lucy. Uh, scientists call her Ast Australopithecus afarens. And she wasn't just our ancestors and Neanderthals' ancestors. She was the ancestors of a whole suite of humans. Something like 14 humans have lived over the eons. Most of them are now extinct. A little bit of the Neanderthal genes continue to live in us, but most of these others had a dead-end line of succession. Coelacanth, still just a coelacanth. Now we're going to go back one more power of 10 to 40 million years ago, all right? So now we're talking about these little shrew-like organisms wandering around in the jungle that weren't just our ancestors, but also the ancestors of all living primates, lemurs, monkeys, and all the great apes, as well as, of course, humans. And now the coelacanth side. Now at this time, you may be saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How can all of those vertebrates over there come from something that looks so dramatically different? And I keep showing the same picture of the coelacanth over and over and over again. Well, it turns out I have pretty good evidence for that because there are actually two species of coelacanths that now live on Earth. In the 1990s, a second species was discovered in Indonesia. And they've done a full genome analysis of them and concluded that they last were sharing genes about 30 million years ago. And they look nearly identical today. So if you have two populations that haven't shared genes in 30 million years, you can be pretty confident that if they look identical today, their shared ancestor 30 or even 40 million years ago probably looked almost exactly the same as they look today. So that's why we have in the case of a terrestrial mammal, great phonetic diversification, whereas we have in the fish side, um, not so much, at least morphological, you know, we have genetic diversification, but not so much the morphology. All right, let's keep going. Let's go now to 400 million years ago. What's going on? That's when these two vertebrates last shared something in common. My common ancestor with the, the uh, coelacanth was around about 400 million years ago. These are rounded numbers, but I like that four. I can, I can, you know, plus or minus 20 million years, something like that. But not only was it my ancestor and all of our ancestors and the coelacanth's ancestor, it was also the ancestor of all terrestrial vertebrates, right? All of them. Not the fishes, but, but the terrestrial ones. The, and in fact, that's the whole dinosaur lineage right there, fits within this picture. So we're talking large periods of time.
And we're not even at the beginning of the story yet. We still have to go one more power of 10, not quite, but nearly 4 billion years ago. And that's where we find the origin of all living things on Earth. And I'm again going to remind you that those lines aren't lines. They're not just white things. They are actual representations of actual reproductive events. Parents begetting children, begetting children, begetting children unbroken for four billion years. If you break one of those links in the chain, you end up with extinction. They're not here anymore. So literally everything on Earth that's alive today can chase, trace its ancestry back generation after generation after generation, four billion years. And we think of biodiversity as that little sliver that just happens to be alive today. And it's a pretty broad spectrum of living things that is that biodiversity. Everything from insects to, to fungi to protozoan to all kinds of bacteria and, and archaea and other kinds of microbial things. We're only just now beginning to really appreciate how widespread this biodiversity is. And right now, the estimates of the total number of species on planet Earth is somewhere in the range of 10 to 30 million species. Nobody's pinned that down. Some estimates are as high as 100 million, some are as low as maybe 8 million, but 10 to 30 is kind of the range of how many of the descendants of everything on Earth are still alive today. And so global biodiversity is this result of this unbroken train of reproduction events, century after century, millennium after millennium, across spanning 4 billion years. Tens of millions of species still living today, all evolved in their own separate ways in response to various hostile and, and changing global environments, right? So when you think of it this way, what really separates, fundamentally separates life from non-living chemistry is the way in which information is propagated through time. Big time, deep time, the large spans of time that information is perpetuated and evolves and changes over time. Information is really what makes life special. So if you think about it that way, instead of thinking of them as species, think of them as books. Each species represents its own little collection of knowledge, its own little collection of wisdom, which is the product of a four billion year history of how it came to be. That's valuable information, which I'll get into in a moment. So the entire, you know, the contents of these books have been edited and re-edited through that process of natural selection for millennia. Right? Okay, so, so far you understand all the things I've told you. You've known this if you understand evolution. But I'm trying to present it in a way that presents it differently. So don't think of them as species. Think of them as stories. Each living thing on Earth today has its own four billion, legacy, four billion year legacy of wisdom that it, it has accumulated over all of this time. All right. So really what biodiversity is, is Earth's greatest library. Now that may seem a little bit abstract, so I'm going to get into some very specific, tangible examples that might make more sense, okay? So biodiversity isn't just a library, it's unambiguously the most valuable resource on Earth in terms of the future of humanity is concerned. For example, almost, almost all the oxygen we breathe, which we need to survive, comes from biodiversity. In fact, this one species, it's a, it's a, a tiny um, cyanobacteria that lives out in the ocean, a single species responsible for somewhere between 13 and 48% of all the oxygen in the atmosphere. All right? All the food we eat comes from biodiversity, either directly, the wonderful meal some of us had earlier, or indirectly. Biodiversity is what pollinates our crops. You know, the crops are biodiversity, and the organisms we depend on to keep that biodiversity useful to us as food. Thank you, biodiversity. It's our most powerful weapon in the fight against climate change, right? Photosynthesis sequesters something like 250 billion tons of CO2 annually. We don't have technology that can emulate that yet. All right, drugs. Half of all drugs come from biodiversity, pharmaceutical products that cure things like cancer and AIDS and Alzheimer's disease and many, many others, all come from what so-called natural products of organisms. Again, I think many of you already know this, but I want you to see biodiversity through the spectrum of what its value is, not just to us, but the entire future of humanity. Now this estimate, I actually find a little hard to believe, but I saw it cited multiple places. The annual economic value provided by biodiversity to humans. If we had to replicate everything biodiversity does for us, we're talking somewhere between 150 and 170 trillion dollars per year. That's what biodiversity means to us here on humanity. And again, not just us, but all future humans that are ever going to live. 
So the most important secrets contained within this giant library are the ones we don't even know about yet. Now why I want you to think about it that way is imagine the Library of Congress with all its wealth of information and you've got kindergartners running free without chaperones just wandering through the aisles. What do kindergartners do, right? They'll pull books off shelves, they'll build forts out of them, rip pages out, make paper airplanes, color, do what kindergartners would do when they're oblivious to the value of the information that surrounds them. There's Homer, there's Shakespeare, there's plans for microchips in these tomes that surround them. Kindergartners don't get the value of that information. We in human history right now are kindergartners when it comes to understanding the enormity of the value biodiversity has to offer. We're learning quickly, but um, that information is out there. And I love this quote by Rachel Carson, who was talking about biodiversity, when she said that when we are wise enough, perhaps we can read in them all of past history, for all is written there. She's talking about biodiversity. So biodiversity is the world's greatest library. And it's burning. You know it's burning. You read this in the news every single day. I don't need to hammer this home to you. I'm not going to tell you that we need to you know, go protect biodiversity because of all of these reasons, because you already know that. You already know what's happening. But I want you to really comprehend the value of what we're losing because of this raging fire that surrounds us, caused by these and many other factors. All right, so worldwide, we spend about 124 to 143 billion dollars on biodiversity conservation each year. That's wonderful, that's a big large number, and that's what we need to be doing. That is what the firefighters are doing, right? We are funding those firefighters to go out into the field and protect biodiversity while it's still here. Find where the endangered species as best they can and do whatever they can to lobby politicians and voters and whomever they need to convince that biodiversity is worth protecting. That's what conservation biology is and it is so important. But it's not the only thing that needs to be done. Because despite their heroic, heroic, heroic efforts, the firefighters are clearly not winning yet. We're falling behind, the fire continues to rage. We haven't even found most of the books yet, and I'll get to that in a little more detail. What do I mean by that? So here's a graph, okay? So after 250 years, which is how long scientists have been documenting biodiversity in the form of formal scientific names. After 250 years, we've only documented and discovered and named a fraction of living things on Earth. We're not even sure how many are out there yet to be named, but even the most conservative estimates of total biodiversity, say 20 million species, we've only named 2 million of them. We're only 10% of the way there. So at the current rate of discovery after 250 years, it will take us 2,500 before we finish the card catalog of just knowing what's out there, let alone what secrets it has to offer. But it's even more dire than that because time is running out. Because if you look at total biodiversity, because this library is burning, you've all heard we're facing the sixth great extinction. This is coming like a freight train towards us. We don't know quite how quickly, we just know that it is. We don't know exactly how fast we're losing species, we know that we're losing them at an unprecedented rate. So if you think of every species being extinct as burning the last copy of a book, you can begin to appreciate why that matters, for not just for ourselves, but for all future generations of humans who haven't existed. Because once it's lost, that wisdom that that species contained and all the secrets it contained are lost forever. So, what do we do? Well, this is a graph we used to show, and when we talk about this stuff, is something needs to happen here. What is that something? We need to understand biodiversity way faster than we've been doing it for the last two and a half centuries, right? What does that mean? We need more scouts. We need those people to go out into biodiversity, out into the library, find out where everything is, document it, and bring that information back. So I love this quote from a dear friend of mine, uh, Brian Green, my colleague, who I'll talk about more about in a moment, and I were at a meet conference uh, in November, and, and we were explaining to my friend here, Dr. Sylvia Earle, you may have heard of her, she's a famous marine biologist, that, you know, what our plight, what our mission was, and she just stopped, and she just blurted this out. Conservation is not just about protecting what we know, it's about protecting what we don't know, and that's the focus of what I want to tell you about tonight, is what we don't know.
Here's what we do know. We do know that over 70% of the Earth is ocean. Over 99% of the habitable habitat is ocean. We live on an ocean planet. Okay, so now I'm going to segue a little bit into not just biodiversity writ large, but specifically marine biodiversity. And one other quote from Sylvia, which I love, is that even though right now in our catalog of life on Earth, there are more species that live on the land, she refers to these as the splintery tips of the tree of life. What she means by that is most of those species are insects. They're all within one phylum, arthropoda. Right? If you want to look at the big trunks of the tree of life, the really big, deep branches, the different phyla of life, most of them only live in the ocean. That's where the big tree of life is. It's under marine life. So even though we may be losing more species, each of those species is less unique on land than where the true deep biodiversity occurs, which is in the ocean. And within the ocean, Coral reefs are essentially the canaries in the coal mine. They are the ones, and again, you've probably read this in the news, just recently, the greatest bleaching event in the history of recorded history is happening right now on the Great Barrier Reef and elsewhere in the Pacific. So this number has come even before that, but anticipating all of this, approximately 70 to 90 percent of the world's corals could disappear by 2050. And that's by relatively conservative models, right? Something like 90 percent of all marine life might face extinction by the year 2100. These are real threats to the biodiversity that lives in the sea. And we're compounding that by the fact that we understand biodiversity in the sea far less effectively than we do on land. Most marine biodiversity has eluded discovery for centuries, right? We're terrestrial mammals. We explorers, we're designed to operate here up on the top, right? Other than, you know, for most of human history, we have been limited to the, only the very briefest excursions to the shallowest depths, right? So the, the life forms that humans have already identified and cataloged, that card catalog of that library of life, are by definition the easiest ones to find. As time goes on, it gets harder and harder to find new species that nobody's else yet bef found before. Those corridors in the library run deeper and longer and, and more labyrinthal than what the prior generation of explorers have had to deal with. So this is a little too much text. You don't need to read it. But the, 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 sen the sentiment I want to get across to you is that humans have been developing new technologies that have profoundly improved the human condition since the dawn of civilization or even earlier, starting with fire and agriculture and, and domestication of animals and ocean exploration and space exploration and all of these things, humans have gotten better and better and better at because of the advancement of technology. So we must continue this tradition in our quest to document biodiversity as well, this advancing technology. So I work at Bishop Museum. My colleague here, Brian, works at Bishop Museum. We're the largest museum in Hawaii therefore the largest museum in all of the Pacific Ocean, which covers one-third of this planet. Um, it was founded in the 1880s, and, uh, and we have something along the lines of 25 million objects in our collections at Bishop Museum. If you ever come to Hawaii, look me up. We'll be happy to give you a tour behind the scenes, because 24 million of those 25 million are biological specimens in various different collections. And so what M Bishop Museum is, is that vault I was describing. Think about this. When biologists go out and collect specimens, they take them out of nature, which is burning, put them in a way that preserves their existence for future generations, long after those species have gone extinct. We have many extinct bird species in our collection, no longer alive on Earth today, but we have their DNA, we have their morphology, we have information about where they lived and how they lived. Maybe someday somebody could develop the technology to Jurassic Park, some of that back to life again? Who knows? But if we don't have that information in the vault, in those collections, but without that information, that becomes an impossibility. So at least we're holding out hope that by capturing the knowledge of where biodiversity lived, how it lived, what it looked like, what its genes were, we might have a chance. And we at Bishop Museum, we are those scouts. We do a lot of conservation biology, but we're also among a dwindling set of biologists whose focus is to go out, discover, document, discover and document biodiversity before it's gone. So I'm going to show you a video.
environments, particularly the coral reef environments. How do we invent a paradigm where divers and robots can work together to do productive scientific research? So, this is a nice looking fish. So yeah, I, that video was put together by Brian Green, who's sitting right here in the front row, and it kind of shows our highlights of where we're going to, and yes, we did discover a new species of fish. The context of that is we discovered it right when President Obama was deciding whether or not to expand the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument up in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, and we knew it was a new species, and this species is endemic to those islands, mean found nowhere else on Earth. In fact, it's the only fish endemic to that region and so when the president did decide to expand it into a monument we named it in his honor now in order to name something after somebody the polite thing to do is get their permission first he was sitting president at the time in 2016 he wanted to go visit the monument we didn't get a chance to meet him but that was sylvia earl our good friend and we gave her the picture and said hey can you go get his permission and as you can see he called it a good looking fish so that's that's a tacit permission but what that was is sort of a teaser. You're actually the first public group of people to ever see that video. We've been working on developing this thing called XCOR, which you saw at the, at the end there. And Brian and I are among its founders, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we want to do to solve this problem I spent the first half of this presentation describing. So what is XCOR, other than a fancy sounding name that, you know, exciting? It stands for the Center for the Exploration of Coral Reef Ecosystems. And it's built on a legacy that goes back more than a century, and it's basically the idea of it is to leverage the latest technology to explore environments in ways that our predecessors in, in biodiversity exploration were unable to do. And in some senses, we've been doing this for decades, and so we have extensive research. We've already had a global impact. But in other ways, we're really just about to begin. We're about to embark on the real next chapter of how all of this stuff will work. So I'm going to explain a little bit about the legacy. So this guy's name is Jack Randall, Dr. John E. Randall. If you're a fish nerd, and I know at least a couple of you in the audience are fish nerds, you've, uh, you've heard of this guy. Why have you heard of him? Because he is the greatest ichthyologist who ever lived. Now that might sound like hyperbole, it's not. There are multiple objective metrics. He's neck and neck with most number of species discovered in all of the history going back 250 years, which is amazing because remember, he started his career in the 1940s. There were 200 years of his predecessors who had a head start finding all the easiest fishes, right? He came along 200 years after them and managed to find more new species than his predecessors could. How did he do that? He did two things. One, he chose to look on coral reefs, which have very high biodiversity. But the other thing was a time, there was a moment of fate, which is that he began his career when a brand new technology was just coming online that none of his predecessors had access to, called scuba. You've probably heard of scuba. Well, he was diving with scuba, an early version of it, even before Jacques Cousteau popularized it. So he was really an early adopter of that new technology. And because he was the first to do it in an area that had enormous biodiversity, he surpassed all his predecessors in discovering and documenting more new species than anyone else. He also invented methods for photography of fishes. He also did a long list of things. I could spend an hour just telling about his legacy. But he was the advisor of both Brian and myself. He's the one who introduced 
introduced us to each other when we were much younger than we are today. He passed away at 20, in the year 2020 at the age of 95, but he was scuba diving up until his 90s. I took him for a dive on his 90th birthday. He was publishing up until a couple of weeks before his death. So he really was dedicated to his craft. And Brian and I, our goal is to continue that legacy. We will never match or even come close to matching the number of new species, but we want to maintain that spirit of adopting the latest technologies to explore coral reef habitats that no one before has even, including Jack Randall. And I'll come back to that in a moment. I'm going to introduce you to our four key core team members. Myself, you've already been introduced to. Brian Green, who's sitting here in the front row. You should talk to him afterwards. Um, yeah, yes, please. Uh, he's an amazing, amazing. He's a much better fish nerd than I am and a much, much better videographer. Thank you. Yeah, talk to him afterwards. He's got an incredible life story. But he and I, together, along with our colleague Cassie Lyons, who's, one of, who's about to get her PhD at the University of Hawaii studying coral, I mean, starting fish larvae. And, and it's a whole long story, but the, the story of fish larvae is a giant black box that has huge implications that until now technology limited our ability to understand. She's using her own kinds of new technologies to understand larvae. And this is our colleague uh, Ken Longnecker. You saw him in the video, the guy with the man bun up there. He's one of our deep diving colleagues. He also does um, uh, uses technology like stereo photogrammetry, which I'll show you in a minute, to do ecology of fishes, to life history of fishes. And he works in remote places with villages so that they can better understand how not to overfish their populations. So I, I can't continue without also referencing our good friend and colleague, Josh Kopis. He was actually one of the original inspirations that we create this x -Core thing in 2013. We were sitting around one evening after a deep dive in Anilao, Philippines, and Josh said, why don't we just create an organization and really, you know, drive this home? Sadly, ja Josh passed away in 2019. Uh, he, he was on an expedition with Brian and I and other friends of ours and, and on, had a very bad accident on his diving, uh, on our last deep dive of the expedition, and and he didn't survive. But we, we consider him to be very much part of the x -Corps legacy and very much of what allowed us to get to where we are today. So coming back to Jack Randall. Jack Randall used scuba to go underwater and see things that people before him could never see. In fact, even while all his contemporaries were still using scuba, he still was finding more species than anybody else. But Jack had a limitation because regular scuba pretty much limits your effective diving depth to about 50 meters or 165 feet. That's deeper than where most scuba divers go. It's not quite as deep as where Jack would go. He'd push those limits a little bit further. But reality, you can't do that much scientific work. And I could go into the physiology of why that is uh, as much as anyone is interested, but it would take me an hour again. So I'm going to just take my word for it. Regular scuba limits how deep you can go. So how do you go deeper? You use submarines, right? Obviously, that's a technology we get access to to be able to go deeper than where scu uh, scuba divers can go. But submarines have two fundamental problems. One of them is they're really expensive. They cost something on the order of thirty to forty thousand dollars per day to use, right? Brian and I do an entire expedition for that amount of money with multiple people, but one submarine dive is a very, very expensive proposition. But there's an even bigger problem, especially if you're studying a habitat like a coral reef, which is that if you are stuck inside that submarine, peeking out that little porthole, and you're trying to see tiny little fishes and invertebrates living on that reef, you're kind of limited, all right? Submarines are really good for spending lots of time down deep, and they're not really good for understanding cryptic organisms. And the cryptic ones, the little tiny ones, are the ones that haven't yet been discovered yet, the uncatalogued books in the library. So it turns out if you're going to spend that much money on a submarine that can go thousands of feet deep and it's not very effective on a complex habitat like a coral reef, you're going to take that submarine thousands of feet deep. So the vast majority of scientific research using submersibles is well below 200 meters. And so what's that sort of created over multiple decades is this zone between where divers go and where almost all submarine research is done, where we know almost nothing about the habitat. Now, when we first started doing this 30 years ago, we started calling it the Twilight Zone. It was the perfect name for this habitat. It was a literal Twilight Zone. Above 50 meters, the sunlight will light up these coral reefs and drive photosynthesis. Below 200 meters, it's almost perpetually black and dark. And the zone in between is the transition, just like twilight in the evening. And so that was great. There were a couple of problems. One, 
our PhD professors sort of said, nah, that's too wooey. It's not sciencey enough. So we started calling them. It was also, it wasn't an effective way of sort of characterizing what we do because people would always hear Rod Serling's voice in their head. So we started calling them deep coral reefs, which worked for a little while until people started discovering a completely different kind of coral reef community that lives thousands of feet deep in cold water, has nothing to do with those shallow coral reefs that we study. So we couldn't call it that. It was too confusing. For a while, we called them deeper portions of typical shallow tropical coral reefs which is a little bit of a mouthful. And then in 2010, there was a workshop sponsored by NOAA, uh, the, the federal agency, and we came up with mesophotic coral ecosystems, which is about on the opposite end of the sexy scale as Twilight Zone is. But one advantage of it is if you Google mesophotic, you pretty much find stuff about deep coral reefs. If you Google Twilight Zone, you get a whole bunch of stuff. So, so it is a practical term to use, but that mesophotic coral ecosystems is what we now in the science community. So what about the technology? So XCOR is about leveraging the latest technology. Jack Randall revolutionized ichthyology by putting a scuba tank on his back. Brian and I risked our lives many times as teenagers trying to find the fish that Jack never found before and push the limits of scuba beyond where we should have. We both paid the price for it in various ways and realized that we would die if we continued trying to beat the laws of physics. The laws of physics always win and physiology as well. So we turn to what the military and the commercial guys do, this mixed gas diving and particularly rebreathers. Again, I could spend an hour or more just telling you about rebreathers. If any of you are divers or want to learn more, let's talk after this. I'll tell you all about it. But essentially, a rebreather does what its name implies, which is a scuba diver will take a, a breath out of a compressed gas tank on their back, and then when they exhale, those bubbles go off to the surface. They're gone forever. The reason we breathe is two things, to inhale uh, oxygen, we need oxygen to survive, and exhale carbon dioxide to get rid of the carbon dioxide. Well, it turns out carbon dioxide is the driving force in our respiration. So when we inhale 21% oxygen, which is what air is, we're exhaling about 19% oxygen. In other words, most of the oxygen we inhale, we also exhale. It doesn't get used. It's lost as a scuba diver. A rebreather, as its name implies, captures that exhaled breath runs it through a backpack, and your backpack has two jobs. One is get rid of the carbon dioxide that you just exhaled, which it does using this stuff that looks like kitty litter. Um, it's a chemical compound that, that pulls the carbon dioxide out. And then its second job is to replace the tiny amount of oxygen you consumed, which it does using electronic systems, and then return that essentially same breath back to you, and you rebreathe the same breath over and over. The other secret formula in making this work is replacing the nitrogen and oxygen that we breathe with with less oxygen, less nitrogen, and replace it with helium. That's a whole nother long lecture. I won't go into more, but I wanted to give you at least a technical view of what rebreathers are and why they've enabled us to go deeper than Jack Randall has. Specifically, it's because, one, we're not wasting as much gas. So it works out with the physics are that if your tank, your scuba tank will last you an hour at the surface at a depth of 300 feet, that's 10 times the ambient pressure. That means 10 times the gas molecules in every breath you take, which means a scuba tank lasts one-tenth as long. So instead of an hour at the surface, you get six minutes at 300 feet. The other thing is that the nitrogen and the oxygen cause all kinds of physiological problems under that amount of pressure. The gas that doesn't cause those problems is helium. So adding helium to the mixer makes us talk funny, but it also allows us to go to these depths and, and do things with a clear head without running out of it. So that's the sort of story of rebreathers that Brian and I have pioneered in the scientific era after over the last 25 plus years, uh, actually closer to 30 now. Um, and so that is, that is our key technology that got us to where we are. But honestly, after decades of doing this, now we're bumping into limitations of rebreathers. We were looking at other technologies to allow us to go beyond those, those technologies. So submarines are obviously a technology. Now, lots of money required for submarines, but what's interesting is you can do things with a submarine and a rebreather diver that neither can do by itself. So we've been figuring out how do we take these two technologies and synergistically make them, allow them to do more biodiversity discovery and documentation than either one could by itself. And again, I could tell you all kinds about it.
things about that. Here's another area of exploration we're working that's been funded by Eric Schmidt's uh, foundation, the Schmidt uh, Ocean Technology Partners. So a very good friend of mine and Brian's uh, lives in Austin, Texas. His name is Bill Stone. He used to work for the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. He's a famous cave explorer down in Mexico. There's some Nat Geo films about his cave exploration work. But what he does for a living is he gets NASA funding to build autonomous robots as prototypes to go up to Europa and other places to search for life on moons of Jupiter and Saturn. And, and these prototypes, think about it, they're designed to go in an aqueous water environment and search for life. So eventually, Brian and I went to Bill and said, you know, we got an ocean right here that doesn't require any rockets at all that we can go test these things. And so we've been working with them for the last few years to modify these autonomous robots intended for outer space exploration to be used right here on, on planet Earth in, on our coral reefs. So this is one of the technologies we're working on further refining. Brian is a wizard with underwater videography. You saw just a tiny sample of what he's capable of doing. He has some of the highest end cinema cameras that are made, Hollywood level cameras getting Hollywood level imagery, not to sell to Hollywood, but to document biodiversity in a way that Jack Randall never could. Jack Randall practically invented underwater fish photography using 35 millimeter film. The cameras that Brian uses are so far beyond that. We are able to capture more information in a single video clip than Jack could have ever done with all of the film in the world. And he's able to capture more nuance than just specimens. Specimens are necessary too, but the imagery gives you the big picture, shows you everything that's down there, gives you context. Right now, when we see 16 millimeter movies that were shot in the 1960s on coral reefs, that's gold, because that shows us what those reefs looked like back then in a way that words on paper couldn't capture. So the video that Brian's shooting, and he's upwards of a terabyte a day is what he captures on some of our expeditions, that is not really for us. That's for the people 100, 200 years from now to be able to see what coral reefs looked like here in the early 21st century. So here's another technology we use. Some of you may have heard of it. It's called structure from motion. You essentially take thousands of still photographs that overlap each other, and you have a computer algorithm stitch them together and recreate a 3D model. So I'm showing you this. It's crude. You can see there's holes in the data. But this was the first dive I ever made where somebody earlier in the day explained to me what to do. And this was at 200 feet in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, and I had 20 minutes to swim as fast as I could and mow the lawn and try to get as many pictures as I could. That reef that you just saw in 3D is 200 feet by 200 feet. So I was able to capture in one 20-minute dive a not-too-shabby three-dimensional model of what that actually looked like. Obviously, the technology is way more advanced now, but that's an area of technology that is ripe for the ability to explore and document these habitats. Stereo videogrammetry. I mentioned Ken Longnecker, our college, uses that. It uses dual camera systems to run a fish transect. And the reason you do dual is because it gives you binocular vision, and a computer algorithm can then reverse engineer how large those fishes were, which is a very critical piece of information to understand life histories of fishes and, and population dynamics of fishes, how many adults, how many juveniles, that sort of thing. So that's another ar area of digital imagery technology that we're using. One that I've been getting into and kind of excited about, it's a bit of a gimmick now, but I think it has great potential, is 360 or virtual reality imaging. Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with these cameras that take 360 omnidirectional video in real time. This is a frame from one of the videos we shot in American Samoa 300 feet recently. So if I put this on your head, you'd be able to spin around and choose what direction you look. I'm going to show you a sample video, not from a deep dive, but one we took on one of our earliest attempts to use this technology in Fiji. So just have a look at what this looks like. So here we are on a reef in Fiji, and it's called Shark Reef, and for reasons I don't know, but uh, they call it that for some reason. Oops, let's try that again. So, um, so I'm not moving the camera. Nobody's moving the camera. The camera is staying stationary. In fact, you're about to see the housing that the camera's in. See that plastic thing? That's the bottom of the housing. This camera is taking video in every direction simultaneously. All I did was put together an edit, and I get to pick which direction you want to see. So if you had a VR headset on, 
you could just be like this and you could choose what direction you want to look at and see this unfolding around you. And so this was obviously a kind of cool place to try out this camera because what they do is they feed the sharks here and it's actually part of a program to conserve the sharks and the reef fishes that live on these reefs. So I thought, wouldn't it be cool to stick the camera out on an aluminum pole and see what happens? And then the sharks kind of came by and I'm like, oh, this is getting exciting. This is going to be great. I can't wait to see this video. And then they got closer and then they got closer and one of them slaps it with his tail. And then another one eats the camera. So now you are inside the mouth of a bull shark, a very large bull shark, trying to swallow you and deciding, well, no, you're not food. So then it spits the camera out. And then the camera floats to the surface because he bit right through the aluminum pole it was on. Now the guy holding the bait catches it. And if you could hear the audio, you'd hear he's laughing hysterically right now. And then he hands the camera off to his other dive buddy, one of the guys who makes sure the sharks don't do anything naughty to the divers. And as you'll see here, he brings me back down. But these are the kind of interesting things you can do with video that's recording the entire environment. It's no longer showing somebody a window onto a coral reef. It's putting somebody on a coral reef. We have a planetarium at Bishop Museum. We're going to put together an edit of this whole story, which is actually a really compelling story. This is the gimmick video we show. But, but there's a really interesting story about this reef and turn it into a planetarium show. So that's something we can do. But also as new VR headsets come along, Apple just released a new one, you can put this in there and not just see through a little rectangular window what these reefs look, you can experience what it feels like to be there. And in this case, almost what it feels like to be eaten by a shark. There's my aluminum pole that the shark just bit right through. So that's another example of digital imagery we're looking to expand, not just for the sort of cool factor, but also for the, the science potential it has. We also do environmental sensor array. This is really important for climate change. Most of the data we have, as I'm sure you know, the oceans are very critical in understanding regulating climate, right? I mean, it absorbs most of the heat that, that, that we've been producing, it absorbs most of the, the um, CO2, and that's why we have ocean acidification. And the problem is most of the data we have on what's going on is at the surface, because we use satellites and surface buoys to measure all this stuff. It's really, really hard to get data below the surface. Why? Because anytime you put a sensor underwater, especially like a light gas sensor to gather how, how much light is reaching these depths, or temperature sensor, or pH sensor, all these pieces of data we really want. Little encrusting organisms will start growing on those sensors and corrupt their, their values. So usually if you put a sensor on a coral reef, you'll get about a week's worth of good data, and by that time you start losing it because the sensors are all encrusted. You're now measuring the, the, the pH of whatever organism settled out on the sensor. What these instruments do, and we're experimenting with, we're working with a company called AML in Canada, they have tiny little UV ultraviolet lights that shine on the sensors for a certain period of time, something like 20 seconds every three minutes, something like that. And that's enough UV light to prevent these tiny little microorganisms from settling out as larvae on the sensors. And we can now run these for a year and the sensors are still clean after a year because of that UV light. And so we have a year's worth of data at 10 second intervals about all these parameters. We just recently recovered these instruments a couple months after being a year. We haven't analyzed the data, but it's the first time we've ever measured 20 meters, 40 meters, 60 meters, 80 meters, 100 meters deep on the same transect in a place called Fungatelli Bay. It's going to be unprecedented data, so we're excited about that. Environmental DNA, you've heard of DNA sequencing. You may have also heard of eDNA, E stands for environmental. That's where you go out and grab a kilogram of soil or a liter of seawater and you run it through a blender and you do the DNA sequence and you can find traces of DNA from many different organisms that are in that environment. Again, this is something that's fairly commonly done in shallow water, not so much done in deep water. So we're working with people who do this kind of research to gather samples of seawater at different depths so they can see, based on the DNA in that water, what organisms live there. And let me tell you, they find organisms that our eyes will never see. But they have a problem because they find DNA sequences of organisms that are not known. So without the work that Brian and I do to actually capture the things so that we can match, oh, this DNA sequence goes with this sponge or this crab or this whatever, it's almost useless data. And so both of them have to work hand in hand. We naturalists have to be down there finding the specimens, getting the DNA methodically, so that the eDNA makes sense in a broader context. It gives it context. And ironically, it's also called a library, a DNA library. So again, with the library metaphors. So we have other innovations too. This is an example of one. I invented and built an underwater vacuum cleaner to help me catch fish. It actually worked amazingly well. I was kind of surprised. Usually these kind of things take about 10 generations before they're actually useful. This one was working right out of the gate. So those are the kinds of things we do to innovate and create new technology. Now, technology is part of the story. 
but research is why we're doing it, right? And this is a quote from that same guy, Bill Stone, the one who funded by NASA to build autonomous robots. He says, the difference between exploration and adventure is data. A lot of people confuse adventure and exploration, right? An adventure is doing something crazy. Exploration is doing something crazy, but coming back with new knowledge about planet Earth. So it's the data that separates, and we like to, you know, we're not doing this for thrills. In fact, both of us would rather retire. We wish those robots got as good as we were at catching fish, because then we wouldn't have to do the deep dives anymore. Right now, the robots aren't there. We still have to go down and catch them, but we can use these technologies so that we don't waste time looking for new species. The robots find the new species, then we just follow the tether down, catch them, and come right back up, minimizing our exposure and risk. So, so it's not adventure we do, it's exploration we do because we're about data. And our legacy, including Brian and I and Jack Randall going back decades, we've been all over the tropical Indo-Pacific and Caribbean as well, but honestly, the real biodiversity is in the Indo-Pacific. This is where we've been. The stars are where we've done deep mixed gas diving. Circles is where mostly Jack and Brian and I and others have done scuba diving. And we've discovered lots of new species of fishes. We're all fish nerds. Jack Randall was the uber fish nerd of all time. Brian and I are fish nerds. This is just a tiny sample of the new species our team has discovered over the the years, over nearly a thousand new species, which is more than any other single team. Is. And you can see they're not all uh, LBJs, little brown jobs as we call them. They're pretty spectacular fish. This is what coral reefs have, but these were unknown to science until we went to the environment where they lived and found them. In fact, this is a nice little stat. We've only done a quantitative assessment of how many species of fishes we discover when we're focused 100% on discovering new species. Often we're not able to do that. Often we're doing a variety of tasks down there, but we did a controlled set of exploration in Fiji a number of years ago, and we worked out that we were collecting 12 new species of fishes per hour of time we spend at that depth. There's nowhere on Earth you can find that many vertebrates that quickly. It gives you a sense for how many undiscovered species are waiting down there. Probably not enough for Brian and I to exceed Jack Randall's legacy of number of new ones discovered, but we'll, we'll get pretty close. Maybe not close, but we'll get up there. We'll be good with our contemporaries. And it's not just new species. This is something we found. We didn't know what it was. We just thought it was some random new species of something or other. Turns out it's a whole new family of fish, not just a new genus, a whole new family of coral reef fish. The last time a naturalist discovered a new species of, a new family of coral reef fishes was over 200 years ago. So finding a new species is hard enough. Finding a whole new kind of fish is very rare. They're down there on the deep coral reefs. Here's the first one we found. And of course, fishes are just a teeny tiny tip of the iceberg. Marine invertebrates are vastly more diverse than fishes. If you consider sponges and crabs and corals and bryozoans and all those phyla, all those big trunks of the tree of life, each one of them are so poorly known by taxonomists these days that practically all of them are new species and they're vastly more diverse than the fishes. So this is the real untapped biodiversity of these deep coral reefs, not the fish we're getting. Those are cool and interesting to us, but the real biodiversity is invertebrates. We also work on cyber taxonomy. Larry mentioned that we created ZooBank, which is the official online registration system for zoological nomenclature. What that means is that whenever someone discovers a new species of any animal, not just fish, any animal, insect, anything, the idea is we create a registration system so the whole world can find out that this new species exists. And we built that, we conceived it, we built it, and this species of fish, which is one of the ones Brian and I and our colleagues discovered and named, is the very first fish registered in that system. We, when you create the system, you have the prerogative to choose who gets to be the very first one, and this is one of our new discoveries that we put in there. Larval biology, I mentioned Cassie Ka'apu Lyons, who's a colleague of ours. She is the up and coming future world expert on fish larvae. The existing world experts on fish larvae are getting up there in their careers. Many of them have already retired, but she's attacking this with new technology. You remember that eDNA technique I told you about? She's looking at the gut contents of these larvae to figure out what they're eating based on the DNA she finds in their stomachs. That's just one of the examples of ways she's figuring out. These, by the way, are each individual frame grabs of video. Again, Brian shot in black water diving off the big island of Hawaii. He was about 60 feet deep. The bottom was about 6,000 feet below him in the middle of the night. I won't even do that. Uh, it was a good dive. <laughs> so this is an interesting, and I put this slide in here for biogeography. Um, this slide's actually appeared on the internet. It's kind of iconic in many ways, but what makes it really cool and interesting is you have to understand, this was taken in Hawaii. It was a place called Curie Atoll, which is the farthest atoll out in the northwestern Hawaiian island chain up towards Japan. 
And if you go to a shallow coral reef in Hawaii and you look at all the fishes that are out there on the reef, about a quarter of them live only in Hawaii, meaning they're endemic to Hawaii. They're not found anywhere else. The other three quarters are species found everywhere else in the Pacific or many other places throughout the Pacific. If you go 300 feet deep, Every fish in that photograph is a species found only in the Hawaiian Islands. One of the things we had no clue about until we started exploring was that the deeper you go, the higher the rate of endemism, which means when you go down deep, the fishes you find and the invertebrates, presumably, we have to confirm it with invertebrates, presumably are unique to that spot, which means deep coral reef fauna is unique coral, you know, proportionally more. So literally every fish, there's no way you could take that photograph in shallow coral reefs in Hawaii and, and, and somehow evade any other species that is not an endemic. So, and they did quantitative surveys. Our colleagues who work at NOAA did a whole series of quantitative surveys that did not record a single non-endemic species up at Curie et al. And further north you go, the more endemic they become. So, coming back to the end of the story I told you about earlier, living fossils. So the coelacanth is obviously a good example of a living fossil. So is a chambered nautilus. It also lives on deep coral reefs. In fact, a lot of the organisms that inhabit these deep coral reefs are what we think of as living fossils. They're ancient life forms that have managed to persist unchanged for long periods of time. And we don't really know why that is. We're presuming because something about that habitat has allowed them to be stable for long enough to not persist. But you know what? And I won't go into details, there's a lot of reason to believe that that's changing now. So we see changes to our environment that's causing extinction. We have reason to believe that these deep coral reefs are actually much more vulnerable to our impacts than you would think otherwise, and perhaps to previous impacts like meteor strikes and other things that have happened before. The coelacanth population alone is potentially at risk right now uh, for that reason. I won't get into the details, but the point is that there's very unique fauna that lives down on these deep coral reefs. All right, so now I'm going to switch over to another quote from a, a fellow I knew not well, but well enough, and he was a great man, Dr. Edward O. Wilson. You've probably heard of him. He passed away recently, a few years ago. But um, I like this quote. In an attempt to make scientific discoveries, every problem is an opportunity. And there are more the more difficult the problem, the greater will be the importance of its solution. So I've sort of described for you the greatness of this problem, this biodiversity library that's burning. But we face another problem. And it's one that is very familiar to any scientist. But I'm going to show you why biodiversity scientists feel this problem much more acutely than other branches of science. So on my x-axis here, I've got dollars. So this is millions of dollars. So the National Science Foundation, a number of years ago, created a program called Planetary Biodiversity Inventory, PBI. And it was dedicated to specifically what I was just describing, documenting the existence of biodiversity, finding new species. And they typically gave grants averaging about $3 million per grant to discover and document biodiversity on a global scale. These were the largest grants ever specifically for discovering and documenting biodiversity from the US federal government. So let's go power of 10. We're going to do another game of powers of 10. So let's ramp that up by powers of 10, 30 million. That's the total amount of money the National Science Foundation spent over its 10-year history of PBI. It ended the PBI program, but over those 10 years, it awarded a total of $30 million to discover and document biodiversity. Let's go another power of 10. So now let's look at some other numbers. This is the entire National Science Foundation budget for all biological sciences, not just discovery, but anything having to do with biological science. This, was, this is the budget. It might be a couple of years out of date, but something on that order, $144 million. Less than one-third the cost of a single space shuttle launch. OK, let's go another power of 10. So we've got the entire National Science Foundation for all sciences, geology, everything. Large Hadron Collider, great, important project, but that was worth what the National Science, one single project costs the same, basically, as what the entire annual budget is for all of science from NSF. Human Genome Project, the biggest biological project ever pulled off, $15 billion over 13 years it took to do that, all right? And that's less, $8, million, $8 billion less than the annual budget NASA had. Okay, the man, you know, it's, it's, it's only half of what we spent on one project, the Manhattan Project. Okay, and we still want more power of 10 to go. So let's look at other big projects, right, that science has funded. The International Space Station, $150 billion. And these are in today's dollars, by the way. Space Shuttle Program, over the course of its life, nearly $200 billion, 
probably over because that's an older number. And of course, the Apollo program, putting a man on the moon, over $200 billion. So that's fine. And I, I don't want anyone to misunderstand me, but I still want to make the point clear that five orders of magnitude separate our largest projects about physics and space exploration compared to biodiversity. Biodiversity discovery and documentation is indistinguishable from zero on this scale. All right, I am not disparaging space exploration. I am not disparaging physics. I am a physics nerd. Physics is my second calling in life. I love space exploration. I really do. I have a framed copy of this, and I'm sure many of you recognize it. This is the, the web version of the original, iconic uh, Hubble Deep Field, Ultra Deep Field. Um, almost everything you see there is an entire galaxy. I mean, that's, just, that's the most profound photograph ever taken. And I've told my kids that. Forget any of this fish stuff. That is where cool stuff is. So I'm not disparaging the importance of, uh, you know, and the vital importance uh, to humanity of physics and space exploration. They are important. I don't, want to, I don't want to be misunderstood here. What I want to get the point across is it's not the only thing that's important to humanity, right? Biodiversity is also vitally important to the future of humanity, okay? But there's a fundamental difference. The universe and the fundamental nature uh, of matter and energy, they're going to be around for a really long time. They're not changing. The same is not true of biodiversity. We are losing biodiversity. That library is burning. And what we're losing is not the matter, it's not the energy, it's the information accumulated over four billion years of evolution of four billion years of navigating adversity like meteor strikes and climate change and all the things that have happened to this planet over four billion years. The things alive today that can do photosynthesis, converting sunlight energy to chemical energy with 97% efficiency, they figured out how to do that. Imagine if we could do that with our existing solar panels, right? The knowledge that we kindergartners are oblivious to that's embedded within biodiversity is beyond our current comprehension and we're losing it. All right, so I'm going to wrap up now. I know it's been a while, and I, but I'm coming to the conclusion here. We simply cannot afford to continue the status quo in battling that fire that engulfs the global biodiversity. The stakes are way too high. A renewed focus on exploration, documentation, and discovery. Biodiversity using the latest technologies represents our last best hope to save it, right? The future of humanity, this is not hyperbole, genuinely depends on it. There is no time to waste. So I'm going to close with a quote from these two people who you saw briefly in the video a little while ago. President Obama makes a very good point. We are the first generation to feel the effect of climate change and the last generation who can do something about it. I think he stole that quote from me. And the reason I think they're actually, you can maybe back that up, is I said that about 10 years before he did. And the person who was in the room, who I said it to, is Dr. Sylvia Earle, who then later had a conversation with President Obama. So I think maybe. But anyway, I think... I think Dr. Earle's quote is even more important, which is what we do or fail to do in the next 10 years will have magnified impact over the next 10,000 years. So I hope I was able to show you things you already knew in a different light and help you understand things in a better way. Uh, I apologize if this was not, you know, if you, this was all self-evident to you, but it, I, I, it took me a while to get my head around this, and I hope, I hope you take away from this a message that we really, 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 it's not just begging for money, it's not. It's about priorities for the future of humanity. So thank you very much. We have time for uh, a few questions and possibly some answers. And we'll start with our wonderful sponsor of tonight's lecture. I'm Frederica Darima, and I'm a member. Thank you so much for uh, a very compelling presentation in many respects. Uh, amazing technology that you're employing. Um, I, I think you make a very good case regarding funding and uh, maybe you can speak with some people in Congress like Rand Paul, for example, <laughs> who has a different opinion about uh, NSF funding. Uh, the amount that you showed about NSF was a little bit on the low side, but uh, maybe only about three or four times more, still very small, as okay. you pointed out. So I have a lot of questions, sure. but I, wanna, I will ask one. Um, you are collecting a lot of data, as you said, you're creating a, a database for you know, various uh, of these uh, uh, environments. 
especially for you know the coral reefs, you are creating a, a whole wealth of data that show places where the coral reefs survive better, uh, others that don't. Um, remediation kind of uh, uh, efforts uh, that some work. Similar. What can we get from all that? Number one, maybe um, if we cannot save all the places, where we can maybe uh, focus, uh, maybe um, focus on coral reefs that may be more uh, tolerant, um, seed areas, create kind of new areas, mm -hmm. so we can replace those that because of various conditions, and it's a very complex environment, as you pointed out. So what efforts uh, are with respect to that? Great. Thank you. thank you very much. And thank you again for sponsoring this evening's presentation. Um, so the questions essentially are, if I understand you correctly, is like, what is the value of our data? How do we utilize and leverage this data to help guide future directions and do certain things? And you alluded to what some people may not know is there are teams that we know and work with who are essentially understanding how to genetically modify corals to be more tolerant and in doing things like this that might give corals sort of an extra boost beyond the rate at which natural selection would allow them to get there on their own. We support and applaud that, but we're skeptical that that's going to, they're going to win that race because the scale of what needs to be done is so enormous, uh, it, it's, it's hard to reconcile those things. Maybe it'll work, and I definitely want them to keep doing what they're doing. But in terms of our data, I guess I'll have to quote Donald Rumsfeld, and I hate doing that, but uh, you're all familiar with, you know, we got known knowns, we got known unknowns, and we got unknown unknowns. And we, we often categorize our fish that way. When we're on the reef, we're looking around, we go, yeah, you're a known known, you're a known known. You're a new species, but we've caught you before. And then, whoa, when the unknown unknowns come up, then we know we got something new. Anyway, the reason I use that quote is because we are still very much at the unknown unknown stage of we don't know what the value of this information is going to be yet. We have little glimpses of it, but again, we're still kindergartners too. We're just smart enough to realize that when we look back at movies taken in the 1960s, how precious little there is of that, how valuable it truly is. So in a sense, Unlike most scientific efforts, we don't know in advance what the value of our data is going to be. We just feel compelled to know that it is. Now, there are some tangible values. For example, I mentioned endemic species, right? When we find a new species on a deep coral reef and bring up one specimen and give it a name, by definition, it's endemic to wherever we found it because who knows where else it lives. We need to explore more areas to, you know, absence of evidence is an evidence of absence. So we need to convince ourselves that a fish is truly endemic to a certain area versus not, and, and there are reasons why we've already gone through that exercise, so I can stand by my claims made earlier. But I guess the thing, that we are discovering that what kinds of species are widespread, therefore potentially more resilient because they live in a wide range of habitats, as opposed to species that are very particular to a specific environment. And then the other unknown unknown is the data we pull off those sensor arrays. We don't know what they're gonna tell us about climate change. We know what the sea surface temperature looks like from satellite data. We don't know, ocean is a 3D space. We don't know how deep that penetrates on an oceanic scale. So those are kinds of examples for how the data we're trying to capture are feeding back into guiding how our colleagues will continue to work. The discovery of, of different biogeographic processes happening on deep reefs versus shallow is helping to guide biogeographers to help answer those questions. So I don't know if that's quite what you're asking, but that's my best way of addressing your question. Hello, uh, my name is Hayden Koss. I'm a guest here, and I will definitely be coming back. This was a wonderful lecture. Um, I was asking, like, I know there's been a lot of extensive efforts to like study current biodiversity and protect current fish species, even though in the hopes that like future generations will come back and actually look at those species. Um, I was wondering, like, what efforts exist currently to look into like the past? I know it's silly, but like, in terms of like retroactive looking at like folklore, or, like something silly like the Loch Ness Monster. Um, is that something that's on your radar? Are those behavior you guys are studying? Um, if that question makes sense, I just, you know, I find sure. this work very fascinating. I think so. Um, Loch Ness Monster, I have to convince, is probably not on my radar. Um, so when you describe a new species, you have to give it what's called a type specimen. And so when it actually has a scientific name, the Loch Ness Monster, but it turns out the type specimen is a rock. So it turned out not to be. But anyway, um, getting to your more general question, going back in time, like using lore. Uh, my colleague here, Brian, grew up in Micronesia in, in, uh, in the Pacific, in the middle of the Pacific, and is very much aware of how that 
oral history can tell us a lot about what lives in the ocean. In fact, not just in the past, but even in the present. There's a wonderful book called, by Robert Johansson called Words of the Lagoon. It's about Palau, where I lived for a while. And it, it's basically an exploration of how the indigenous knowledge of fishing practices vastly exceeded what the scientists understood about where certain species breed, what time of year they do that, where you can catch them, where they can't, where the males are. You know, they understood that far better because of that oral tradition of understanding. And of course, their lives literally depend on it for, for generation after generation. From a scientific side, there's not much of a fossil record for these. There are for corals per se, and, and because corals are built upon corals on skeletons. But in terms of the fishes and many of the other invertebrates, there isn't really a fossil record. So there's very limited we can do in terms of looking backwards in time. We can try to make inferences. For example, we have a coelacanth population in Indonesia and a coelacanth population in South Africa. And we can find that they didn't swap genes for the last 30 million years. So there are ways we can reverse engineer some of the history, but we're, we're limited in that way. I, I don't know if that's exactly what you're asking, but yeah. Uh, that's the best we can do, at least with current technology. Uh, my name is Jan Post. I uh, used to work, uh, work as a biologist for the World Bank. Um, <clears throat> my question is, uh, the announcement for this lecture was about uh, deep sea corals. And <clears throat> I was wondering, if there are deep sea corals, calcareous corals like Lophelia mm -hmm. pertusa that lives in cold water, mm -hmm. mainly on the coast of uh, the Lofoten in Norway and mm -hmm. so on, um, and there is plenty of dark places mm -hmm. and cold places in the ocean, why are there not more species of deep coral, uh, cor calcareous corals mm -hmm. that build reefs elsewhere in the world? That's an excellent question. Um, I'm not a coral biologist as much as I am a fish biologist, but my understanding is these cold, deep, dark uh, Lophelia type, I mean, uh, the, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, groups of corals that live there that do, they do create vast extensive reefs, but they're monocultures essentially. They're sim single species. You have far lower diversity. I don't know the answer to that question. These, by the way, are the deep coral reefs where I had, we had to change our tenor because we were confusing what we were talking about. They're very different ecologically, one of the reasons being that they're very you know, mono-species in, in their makeup. I can't tell you for sure why there are fewer species. I agree with you that there are fewer species of calcareous, you know, hermitypic-type corals at those depths. I can only assume that it has to do with fewer adaptive peaks, that is, sewer, fewer opportunities to exploit the available resources, ultimately energy, um, for finding ways to persist and survive over whatever environmental trauma happens. Those environments are generally even more stable than the deep coral reefs, so it's potential that over evolutionary time scales, there was kind of one winner who managed to master the art of capturing the energy on those deep <coughs> reefs more effectively than its would-be competitors. So perhaps, I don't know this, but perhaps the fossil record might show a more ancient, broader diversity than we see now. Whereas, of course, on typical shallow coral reef habitats that do get sunlight, the energy flow and, and the, the heterogeneity of the habitats is such that it might be more conducive to not only allowing more different forms to survive, which we call diversity, but also allowing them to persist over longer periods of time because there's no one answer to how you persist in that environment. That's my best guess. I can't obviously give you a direct answer of why, but it is absolutely true that especially among these, these calcareous corals, there are fewer species on those deep, dark cold reefs than there are up on the shallow tropical reefs. And I will mention one thing. You did emphasize calcareous corals, but there is a broader diversity of non-calcareous corals, of non-hermitypic corals. And I'll mention this because some of those corals, black corals, gorgonians, those sorts of things, they can live 5,000, maybe even 10,000 years, a single individual colony. So they have a different story to tell, where not only the species persists over time, but the actual individual coral colonies persist over time. And the reason it's a relevant and important threat, as you may see in the news a lot now, is deep sea mining, uh, looking for all kinds of minerals on the bottom of the seafloor, have devastating effects on these deeper coral populations that might be take much longer to recover. A regular coral reef might recover in a few centuries, wipe out one of these deep reefs, it could be millennia before they ever come back. So again, a kind of a roundabout answer to your question, but that's sort of the best way I can answer it. Yeah. Blue microphone, and then we'll go to the red microphone. Uh, Matt Kaywood, member. Um, I was interested uh, in what you said about the, 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 how there are more endemic species in deeper on the reef than in the shallow reef. And I was wondering 
um, you know, what the, the sort of rationale for that is and, you know, maybe the island biogeography or whatever sure. the explanation is. Did it, is it harder for them to navigate from one, you know, place to another and feed? But, um, and what does that have to say about both loss of biodiversity at those levels and also potential recovery in, in the future? So first, the why. Um, and it, it was a shocker to us, and it was one of two things that was a shocker to us. It's like, and again, we were controlling for sampling effort. You know, in other words, how do we know something's endemic if you haven't explored everywhere else? So we're kind of limiting our analysis where we have a, a good sort of comparative basis to work with, and that pattern still exists. The other is an interesting thing, and I'll, I'll just have to explain this a little bit to give you context, but the Coral Triangle, which is the Indonesia, Philippines, New Guinea sort of part of the world, is the highest diversity of shallow coral reefs anywhere. And as you move eastward across the Pacific Ocean, you have an attenuating diversity as you go across. Turns out that pattern doesn't seem to exist down deep. Um, we get essentially the same diversity on a deep coral reef in Indonesia that we do in the Cook Islands, that we do in French Polynesia, which was a shocker. A and um, I won't go into too much detail about that, but we recently published a paper, 10,000 word paper, <laughs> over 10,000 words, most journals wouldn't accept it, it was too long. Essentially, a, uh, what we call it is the habitat persistence hypothesis, which gets at your first question, which is why do we think that these things, these patterns exist. Higher endemism, no attenuation of diversity across the Pacific. And our, our speculation is that it's driven by glacial sea levels changes that happen over time. If you have a shallow coral reef, so just for those who don't know, sea level goes up and down something like 100 meters every 100,000 years or so, just roughly over history. And it has to do with glacial cycles, right? You have, a, you have an ice age, all the water freezes up, sea level goes down, and then it cycles. So if you're a coral reef at all out in the middle of the ocean, an insular Pacific Ocean, you've got sheer drop-offs on all sides that go thousands of feet deep. If you're a coral reef in New Guinea or Indonesia or the Philippines, you've got a sloped bathymetry, sort of stepped bathymetry. When you drain the ocean and bring it down 100 meters, in these continental habitats, the habitats are able to migrate as sea level goes up and down this sloped bathymetry. Whereas if you've got vertical drop-offs, you go from a plethora of habitats, tongue and groove, lagoon, all these sort of habitats at high sea level stands, drop the sea level, you've got all these rocks sticking up out of the water, all you have is shoreline and deep. And so our hypothesis is that organisms can persist longer at places that have habitat that will persist across these glacial cycles. So if you're a little planktonic larvae of a fish that manages to get way out into an island in the Pacific. And if you live on a shallow coral reef, you might thrive there for 10,000 years until the next sea level drop. Now your habitat's gone. Now you're gone. But if you are a deep dwelling species and you land on a deep drop off, you're just basically a tide gauge going up with sea levels. Your habitat does not disappear every 10,000 years. You are able to evolve into your own unique species because you can persist there long enough. That was a very, very condensed version of a 10,000 word paper, but that's sort of the answer to your, your first question. And then I think your second part of your question had to do with, oh, no. Loss and recovery. So endemic species are very particularly interesting to biodiversity specialists because endemic means it only lives in a restricted geographic area, which in theory means it's more vulnerable to extinction, right? If it's something that lives all over the planet and you wipe it out in Hawaii, it's still everywhere else. But if it only lives in Hawaii and you wipe it out in Hawaii, it's gone from planet Earth. And so that's an obvious implication of the need for these deep reefs to be paid attention to because they are potentially the most vulnerable species. Um, and then the biogeographic implications will probably take me too long, but if you want to chat afterwards, I'd be happy to. Microphone. Yeah, Man Meet Singh. I'm not a member. I'm a guest of Amit. Um, two questions, one on uh, funding, the other on uh, expanding your outreach. Um, a couple of years in northern Thailand, I met a guy, John, who almost for eight years would go every day right outside Doi Chung Doi to take pictures near a swamp of insects. So several hours a day to the same swamp for years. And I was like, how do you earn your living? And sharing the rights for his pictures and getting some royalties to help with his funding. Something for you to consider. Um, second from expanding your outreach is I also do data and AI from an AI perspective, employing that and expanding or partnering with Patty, because you've got, as equipment gets cheaper, you'll be surprised. I mean, people have some amazing equipment, all of these professional divers, you can go in and when you get that zoo bank going and soliciting pictures, you can employ AI perhaps to see if you have a match or if you have something new. Now you have not just a team of handful, but a whole army of people who would yep. love to contribute. Thank you very much. Those are two really good questions. So 
Uh, the first part of your question, seeking funding through selling rights to images, we've done that a little bit, but honestly, the demand's not high enough to meet the need we have. Brian has the largest collection of these deep coral reef images, and there may be a handful of people who would be willing to pay enough money to license it, but not enough, at least in our experience so far, to really drive that as, a, as our primary source of funding. Um, so we, we certainly have considered that. The other thing is our sort of, uh, our spirit is that when we capture information, that information belongs to the world, and we don't want to have it behind a paywall. I mean, there are models where you can have like frames or, or low resolution or something where everybody can see and then give access to scientists, et cetera. It gets complicated though to monetize that approach to things, at least to the scale we would need to do the sorts of research we, we envision in the future. But, but yes, we have certainly considered that. In terms of AI, we are working with people who do AI on the database side of things, some for pedantic, boring reasons, like cleaning up names of collectors accumulated in our databases over hundreds of years. But in the case of Brian's videos, like even Google already has algorithms that are remarkably accurate at identifying at least species of fishes. And he's got terabytes and terabytes of videos that we don't have enough manpower to go through those things and catalog who lives what where. So our dream, our goal is to match up with the right AI expert who can help us develop you know, learning algorithms to help us teach them through you know, sample sets of known identifications to essentially mine our massive amounts of images to help us at least give us a first pass at identifying what's in those videos and then crowdsourcing, like you say, essentially turn this over to the world via the internet and you can have this iterative process of large numbers of amateurs can get you pretty close Medium numbers of expert amateurs can get you closer, and that essentially self-selects to the point where only the most challenging identifications end up on in the inbox of the true specialist. So we're looking at those approaches to try to pull the information, but the way we see it is that's important, but if we have an hour to spend doing that versus an hour to spending discovering something, we better put our emphasis on capturing the data now and let somebody else mine it later. That's sort of our general guiding philosophy is do the discovery and documentation first and then let others come behind us and do the analysis. Uh, we'll take a couple more questions. Start with the blue mic and then, then one from the web and then if we get the red mic over here to the person in the front row. Oh, uh, hi. Uh, my name is AJ. I'm a member of the PSW here. Um, <clears throat> wonderful lecture. Wonderful lecture and 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 I absolutely agree with your I absolutely agree with uh, the the absolute importance of your library of knowledge and uh, uh, additional money that needs to be or uh, spent on that 3 million 30 million whatever it is i don't agree with what i don't agree with is your comparison with nasa's budgets and other things the reason for that is that i think that uh, if you were to actually look at the amount of money being spent on healthcare in this country, mm. that is 100 times worse. Yes, agreed. And per year, it is increasing by maybe 100 billion or 50 billion a year. Yeah. That's your 3 million or 30 million is pittance compared yeah. to that. So why don't you compare, use that number also in your... I have thought of it. And I have okay. tested that against people. Yeah. And essentially the reason I do it the way I do, and I'm definitely open to changing going forward, is it, it boils down to who my audience often is. A and so if we assume that there's a premise that human civilization prioritizes discovery and understanding of the universe this much compared to all of its other priorities, stopping wars, you know, whatever it is we do, then we're comparing apples to apples in terms of what that slice of civilization prioritizes. What you're getting at, which is actually my core philosophy, is humans are way too self-centered. We spend way too much of our effort focused on stuff that concerns us specifically, which makes sense evolutionarily. We're looking out for ourselves, we're looking out for our genes, we're looking out for our own species first because we share more genes with others of our own kind. But stepping back a bit, most of this biodiversity has been here way longer than Homo sapiens has ever been. And we're blithely disregarding its destruction while we're focused on geopolitics du jour. And when I say du jour, I really mean de century. 
because what we're talking about is most of the things that we focus all our efforts on will probably run their arcs over a few centuries, but biodiversity loss is, is on a scale of millennia. So I'm actually sympathetic to you. It has more to do with how I present it based on who I'm listening to. It's rare I get to present it to an academic audience like this. It's more often they're lay folk, and lay folk get a little bit bristly when you start threatening their health care. <laughs> Yeah. Just add sure. one sentence to yeah. this. You know, it's not that I'm not threatening the healthcare. Yeah. I'm threatening the cost of the healthcare yeah. that has gone way I beyond the inflation. I see what you're saying. Inflation That's all. essentially. No. Understood. Understood. Yes. And that is a fair point. Um, yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I think, I, think, I think the way this message has to be framed, and again, we're not looking for funding for ourselves. I mean, yeah, we always are, of course. But the message we want to get across is more the bigger picture. It's, it's biodiversity. It's all the living things. And that's a scale that really needs a sea change in human attitudes about things. We've witnessed that sea change with climate change. When I was an undergrad, we all knew it was coming. Nobody knew about it. Now at least we're in a paradigm where most of the educated world's cognizant of that problem. We hope that people begin to realize that the true cost of climate change is loss of biodiversity, not for us or our kids or our grandkids, but for centuries of humans yet to come. And hopefully capitalize on that self-centeredness to, to at least encourage them to capture knowledge on biodiversity while we still can. A guest here, oh, there we go, I'm a guest here. So first of all, I'd like to thank you for your very informative lecture. And as, as a student interested in conservation, it's very inspiring to see the work that you and XCOR are doing. Uh, so my question is, when you're diving at at depths below 60 meters, one, do you have issues with pressure? And two, if you do, how do you overcome that issue when you want to collect new data about new specimens? Because right. I assume underwater, your abilities are pretty limited, although yes. new technology is making that more possible. Yeah. Okay, so then your name was Nora, I think, right? I don't know yes. if the microphone caught your name, but thank you. Thank you for that great question. So when we do these deep dives, essentially we're fighting time almost more than anything else. Um, we rarely feel the direct effects of the pressure. And I say rarely, not never, because on a recent dive, Brian and I did, in fact, our last deep dive together, he had issues with his sinuses that weren't clearing. So that's an example of how the actual pressure prevents us from getting to the depths. But really, the way the pressure affects us is ways we don't feel it, which is the pressure increases the concentration of gas molecules in our lungs. That gas dissolves into our blood and tissues, essentially turning us into a bottle of soda while we're down there. We're, we're getting not carbonated, but nitrogenated or heliumated. And then if we were to pop to the surface right away, it'd be like popping the top off a soda bottle. Bubbles come out of nowhere. That's what happens inside a diver's body when they have decompression sickness. That's what caused me to become quadriplegic when I was 19 years old. Brian had a nearly similar. That kind of stuff can kill you, and that's one of the things we worry about. So the pressure effects that you're asking about are not something we feel or sense so much as it is something we know laws of physics will always win if we try to beat them. Um, so in terms of, it doesn't really incapacitate us while we're down there. In other words, there, there is an effect when we start getting very deep. And by very deep, I mean 500 feet, 150 meters or more. There's something called high pressure nervous syndrome, which um, if you ever saw the movie The Abyss, the psycho marine guy, he was suffering from. It's a real effect. It actually causes psychosis and tremors and all sorts of things. Usually it doesn't show up to your 1,000 feet or more unless you go down very rapidly. We descend very rapidly. So when we get to 500 feet, sometimes the, our arms feel almost almost like robotic arms. We're not tremoring, but we're less fluid in our ability. And if you saw Brian scoop up a fish there, you need a dexterity that you know, a conductor would be jealous of to be able to get that net in the right place at the right time. So there is an indirect effect of the pressure on our physiology that it impacts our ability to collect specimens. But as I said at the beginning, our real enemy is time. The deeper we go, it's not that we can only stay so long. Our life support system will give us 10 hours, 12 hours at any depth, depending on how we configure it. The limitation is how long we're going to spend getting back to the surface, which is laws of physics we can't overcome. That gas gets into our body. If we spend, say, five minutes at 500 feet, we're looking at four hours to get back to the surface. Ten minutes, we're looking at eight hours, you know, and it gets bad. The answer to that is a lot of money, and a lot of money is an underwater habitat system where you can actually live at depth. And if we spent one week at 500 feet, it would take us two weeks to decompress to the surface. If we lived one year at 500 feet, it would take us two weeks to get to the surface. If we lived 10 years, it would still take us only two weeks to get to the surface. It's called saturation. It means we've gotten as much gas as we're going to get into our system, and that's the maximum of decompression we have to do. And so the ratio of time spent on the bottom doing things, which in our case is five minutes to five hours of decompression, one to 60, 
you can flip that around and say spend a month at 600 feet and two weeks of decompression. Now you're doing twice as much time on the bottom as you're on the surface. So those are the solutions we're looking at where technology, as you were alluding to, can help improve at least our working ratio at those depths. Blue microphone, question from the web. Yep. Okay, so this is a question from Eric, who is not a member. Uh, so, when can we get a submarine under the ice on Europe and possibly find hydrothermal vents there? Are you sure it's Europe or Europa? Uh, it, he says Europe might have meant Europa. Well, I, I, uh, let's go with both. Um, so, if there, if there are ice sheets on Europe, I suspect people are taking ROVs uh, already underneath the ice shelf and looking at, for hydrothermal vents down there. But I'm going to give you another part of the planet, this planet, that's actually even more interesting. There's something called the, rice, the Ross Ice Shelf. If you go to Antarctica and look at a map of Antarctica, it's got this giant thing called the Ross Sea. Well, that's covered in a giant ice shelf. I think there's 100,000 square kilometers of what effectively is the world's largest cave. It's an ice sheet that's got an ocean underneath it that goes back many, many kilometers. We don't really know what's under there. Right? Probably hydrothermal vents, probably little communities of life. But when you think about it, most technology won't allow you to explore tremendous differences from the entrance to that enormous cave, which faces the Pacific Ocean. But you know, if you had some way of delivering power to an autonomous vehicle that could last years instead of hours, maybe we could start exploring those kind of habitats. People have drilled cores through the ice, taken water samples, but that's just little peekaboo. It is not really telling you it lives in that enormous environment, especially if there are hydrothermal vents there. Um, and so if ever we were going to find something even cooler than a living coelacanth, which is my fantasy, a living trilobite, that's probably where we're going to find it. Um, now, if the question was actually about Europa, which is one of the moons of Jupiter, it is known now to have an ocean, a water ocean, underneath a 15 kilometer thick layer of ice. And my colleague Bill Stone, who gave a great TED talk on this topic, by the way, um, talks about what it would take to go and explore that ocean. That's why he's building those robots. There are almost certainly hydrothermal vents down there. Now, James Cameron, the filmmaker, actually took it to the next level and created a 3D animated fantasy about what we would find there, and, and he hypothesized what we would call eukaryotic life um, that's living down there in those oceans. He may be right. I put my money on bacterial things or things that we would resemble as more bacteria. Maybe there'll be some more sophisticated things. I kind of doubt it. But the really big question to discovering life on Europa off of planet Earth will kind of boil down to, is it the same origin? Meaning, did the life that's there come from here or vice versa? Or did they both come from the same place? There's something called panspermia where potentially the whole universe gets seeded by a little frozen microbes that evolved somewhere else. And if it is the same, which of those is it? And if it is different, if it's a fundamentally different kind of life that doesn't share a common evolutionary ancestry with us, Wow, that opens all kinds of, uh, you know, Fermi's paradox implications about how much life's out there in the rest of the universe. So I, either way, wh whichever web person qu the question was, I did my best. Europe in per se, I don't know for sure. Yeah, it was Europa. Okay, well, good. I answered them both anyway. <laughs> Is there anything else from the web? No. Can we go to a red microphone then? Uh, good afternoon, evening, uh, Rich. I really enjoyed the presentation, Thank especially you. enjoyed the visuals, and I enjoy your tie, by the way. <laughs> tie again. goes with the tie goes with the. With I bought the, it specifically for this occasion. In fact, this is the first time I've ever worn a suit as an adult. But that's, that's yes, great. It's, it's great. It's, it's perfect tie. Um, so I wanted to ask you, and you said something uh, earlier about we're doing this for the world, and I think that's a it's a noble mentality but uh, you know how things are in the real world. And there are communications cables that are buried deep in the sea that presumably have to be maintenance. I wonder how those get laid in to begin with and at those depths of how they're maintenance, et cetera, and what the military implications of them are. And inclusive of that, what is the military implications of some of the diving that you do, even though it's inadvertent, mm -hmm. wherever you step into someone else's pond, if you will, right. there's a potential that you might trip over some things that might not necessarily be savory, right. or could, the implications could be uh, that of uh, concerns from other countries. Sure. So how much cooperation is there really going on? And should this be a U.S. thing? I mean, when mm -hmm. President Obama goes and talks about something, he has the country's interest, or ex-president, when he had the country's interest, but you also have to, is there really cooperation between 
those ab abroad, you know, mm -hmm. Russians and North Koreans and sure. everyone else and Iranians and sure. all those adversarial nations, so-called. Right. What are we going to do about that? Is that going to come up? And does that issue ever come up with you? Thank you. Those are really good questions. And, and there's several ways I can address it. Let me get first to the pedantic parts of those, the very specific parts. So cable laying, yes, there are cables crisscrossing the oceans all over the world to transmit um, data, I information, voice, things like that. My hope is that over time, those will be gradually replaced by radio communications, Starlink, and things like that, so we don't have to actually traverse cables on the cable, having, on the seafloor. Having said that, the impact that my understanding, I'm not an expert in this, but my understanding is the impact of those cable layings, while real, including all the maintenance, as you alluded to, is nowhere near what the deep sea mining threat is posed right now. So that's where the focus is on and getting international cooperation to protect the deep seas before they're lost, before we can even begin to understand what's down there. Um, so those are real things. I am generally not involved in those conversations because those are habitats I'm not an expert in. Brian and I focus on coral reefs, so we're more often dragged into other areas of conservation, setting aside places, no fishing zones, things like that. Um, so scaling back up a little bit higher on the scale, international cooperation is what we would fantasize about, but as you pointed out in the beginning, we live in the real world and the real world doesn't work that way. Um, it would be nice if this sort of message, first of all, if it resonates with people, and sometimes it does, maybe I'm, not, maybe I'm just barking up an empty tree, but to whatever extent, people who are in a position to make decisions that affect whether or not international communities agree with each other or not, if it resonates with them, then we've done our tiny part to get it. It's not, you know, it, it's not so much that we are trying to save the world. That's not kind of, we're not those people. We're not the ones who aspire to do that. We aspire to find new species of fishes because we're fundamentally fish nerds. But what we recognize is that biodiversity has a place on this planet that's vastly underestimated in most conversations about what you talk, which are these sort of global political things. And if you step back one step further, take it back one more order of magnitude, if you will, the problems you described are really just problems that span a couple of millennia, which on the scale of times I'm talking about are a very ephemeral moment on Earth's history. And the question is, how much is our squabbling among different communities on Earth, which we currently call countries, I don't know what we'll call them in the future, geopolitical implications that are on timescales far greater than a human lifespan, how much of that really matters when we're looking back four billion years of biodiversity? And my greatest hope is we're not powerful enough, no matter what we do, nuclear weapons or whatever, to really dent biodiversity. Unfortunately, I doubt that's the case because between climate change and the threat of you know, global nuclear war, Probably the best thing that could happen to biodiversity is we follow our trajectory that we're probably inevitably on anyway and self-extinguish at some point before we cross. And I know that sounds snarky, but it, if you step back enough orders of magnitude and you look at the world on those time scales, pretty soon we're just a bunch of kindergartners running around, right, to come back to that metaphor. And maybe biodiversity has a chance in a very sad to us humans pathway. Maybe, and there's always hope. Hope is a word I cling to very hardly. There's always hope that eventually we'll become sophisticated enough. We'll become middle schoolers. We'll become high schoolers. Maybe even go to college someday as a species and recognize the importance of how cooperation benefits us all much more than competition, which is what's driving a lot of the conflict that we have that you're getting. I don't know. I hope I tried to answer it. Okay, well, thank you. That's my best attempt at that, at that kind of an answer. It's just me fish nerd, waxing philosophic, but that's the way I look at it. I think we'll end with that. I will be around, so if anyone Before wants to chat. Before you go, we have a few gifts for you oh, here. Thank you. We have a framed copy of the announcement of your talk. We have a copy of the, not a copy, we have a, a ribbon, uh, the PSW ribbon that has uh, stripes on the side that symbolize the unit of inductance that was uh, studied by Joseph Henry and led to the development of the telegraph and the telephone. And um, we have a copy of volume one of the Philosophical Society of Washington's Bulletin, in which you'll find why they founded the organization, who the founders were, and how to calculate pi to 30 places. <laughs> thank so you very thank much. You very I really much. appreciate the opportunity. I really okay. appreciate it.
Uh, before you go, we have a few closing announcements. 2495th meeting will be on May 3rd, and the speaker will be David Spurgle. He is a physicist and the current president of the Simons Foundation. He chaired the panel on UAPs, but he's not going to be talking about that except for a couple of minutes. Instead, he's going to be talking about the baby picture of the universe, which is to say looking back in time to the earliest stages of the universe, and what those, uh, what that data tells us about our simple but strange universe. The 2,496th meeting will be the annual Joseph Henry dinner and lecture. It will be on May 17th. The speaker will be Brett Sales, Seals of the University of Kentucky. He'll be speaking on recent success reading ancient scrolls uncovered in Pompeii using X-ray computed tomography and artificial intelligence. And the work opens up a practical possibility that hundreds of profoundly damaged scrolls will eventually be deciphered and will open up a new vast window on the literature of Greece and the literature of Rome. The 2497th meeting will be on May 31st. The speaker will be Masaharu Subakura, and he will be discussing the health effects of the Fukushima nuclear disaster and efforts to deal with it. The 2498th meeting will be on June 14th. The speaker will be former NASA Administrator Mike Griffin, who is currently co-CEO of Logic and recently testified for a different scaled back approach to land the US on the moon in very short time frame. The 2499th meeting will be the last of the 20 lectures of the 2023-2024 lecture series and close the spring semester. It will be on June 28th and the speaker will be Ben Schneiderman and he'll be speaking on human-centered AI ensuring human control while increasing automation. Looking to the fall, a couple of talks that might be of interest that we have already scheduled. We'll have a talk on the facility for rare isotope beams and the uh, structure of nuclei and magic number violation. And we'll also have a talk on constructed languages by the Klingonist who created the language of Klingons. <laughs> that should be a fun talk and interesting one about the structure of language. Uh, we'll be posting further commitments to the website as soon as they are set, so please check www.pswscience.org frequently for updates. Let's thank the people who helped us uh, do the production tonight. And with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn the meeting. And a second. And all in favor? All opposed? Meeting is adjourned to the social hour. <laughs>